Hey guys, it's Caitlin from Reefs.com and welcome to the Reef Table. Today I'm joined once again by Richard Ross and Rhett Talbot to continue our discussion on sustainability. We're going to focus on ethics and address whether or not the hobby industry is justifiable. Hopefully we have some really interesting information for you all and have a great Okay, so here again with Rich Ross of the Steinhardt Aquarium and Rhett Talbot, uh, author for Coral Magazine, and also his blog, The Good Catch. We're here today to talk about uh, sustainability and ethics. So We like to think of this as a sexy time with Rich, Caitlin, and Rhett. Okay, that... That's what we should rename the blog. More people would watch the videos. <laughs> I think you should. Uh, done. Okay. Yes, Kaylin, what would you like to discuss? Hmm. I think uh, ethics can be really sexy. So let's talk about that. So how do we, um, first, how, how would we sustain the justification of the hobby and the industry? Well, what's the, I guess we got to talk about what, what the justification of the hobby is. Can we define ethics first? Yeah, yeah, define ethics first. How's that different than morality? You guys are asking me. I'm, I'm the interviewer. I'm asking Rhett. Oh. I'm asking Rich. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're very similar. Ethics, uh, if I'm remembering this distinction correctly, ethics is personal and morality is uh, more societal. So ethics would be what you decide to do and mor moral would be how that relates to others. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. So we're talking tonight about what we ought to do. Correct. What we ought to do and what one ought to do and what all should do. Perfect. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the justification for the hobby? Right. That's the question. <laughs> That's the first question. That is the first question. I think it's funny because I think that justification for the hobby doesn't come up until um, uh, somebody is pushed to justify the hobby. Well, would right? you think, Otherwise, no, no one thinks about it. Would well, you think... What the, what's a justification for any hobby? It's, it's what you do when you're not doing what you have to do. It's something you do for pleasure. That is, yes. not your, that, is not your, um, that is not your vocation. Like a sexy podcast. <laughs> Correct. That is an advocation rather than a vocation. People are going to get so confused um, as to what this is. So, uh, so hobby, hobbies are done for fun, right? Right. And I think the only reason people try to justify the hobby, any hobby, is when they're kind of up against a wall of, other, of people saying your hobby's bad for some reason. And that's what we're facing. I guess so, yeah. So yeah. now, if we had to justify it, is there any justification to it? May, may I insert a tangent? Yep. <laughs> sure, we haven't started the beat yet. That's just all, it's all tangent it's, time. It's early on. Why not start with a tangent? Yeah. Um, so before I, before I, so I've been an Aquarist for a long time. When I was a kid, I was interested in an Aquarian. But it never intersected with my professional life. It was not something, it was something that I did for fun. And uh, so then my grandfather taught me about. And it wasn't until, gosh, 2009 that I think I first professionally engaged. I merged my writing career with my hobby as an Aquarist. Um, before that point, I was writing almost exclusively about fly fishing. And fly fishing is a hobby that um, is similar. I think there's many parallels between fly fishing and aquarium keeping. It's something that people who are passionate about it do, and they view themselves as being very conservation-minded, and they're connecting with nature and the resource. Yet people who aren't anglers view it as you're ripping lips, torturing fish, and spending a lot of money doing something that doesn't benefit the world in any way, shape, or form. And so I think there's this, there's this, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. I think there's this interesting parallel between fly fishing and aquarium keeping and a host of other hobbies. 
And so the question I ask myself as I've been thinking about that more and more recently is what makes aquarium keeping different than fly fishing? Fly fishing, I think many people in the public sphere think of fly fishing as being almost synonymous with conservation these days. And I wonder why that is. Is it because Trout Unlimited has been so successful in being an advocacy group and being a lobbying group and helping to promote fly fishing on the conservation front? And why are we not there in the aquarium trade or the aquarium hobby? I think it's probably got to do with the location of the resource to the activity. So for fly fishing, you have to actually go in the river. So you see the river, you have uh, experience of the river. If the river is full of crap and trash, you see that. If the fish aren't there, you see that. Um, you're directly connected to the resource. I think in the aquarium hobby, you're not. So I, 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 while, while I see lots of parallels, I think actually the angler fishing, fly fishing is a really good um, an analogy of hobby. Uh, I think that would be the one difference with conservation. Yeah. So what happened when, when, when anglers and aquarists, uh, their hobby was brought under fire for various reasons, um, what, did, what did the fly fishermen do when, they, when that happened? Or fly fisher people, excuse me. You know, I think, I think, the, um, I think with anglers, it's really, and you, know, you notice I use the term anglers because it avoids the, the male, female. Uh, fly fishers. <laughs> fly fishers. <laughs> I think, though, with anglers, I think, uh, you know, I think like, like Aquarius, um, those anglers that are conservation-minded are probably in the very great minority in the same way that it's not that they're not good people, but they don't connect their hobby. I think most anglers don't connect their hobby to conservation. They connect their hobby to drinking beer and taking a few hours off from work on the weekend. In the yeah. same way that many Aquarists you know, view their aquarium hobby not as being directly tied to conservation. Um, Good. That's why, that's why I would say that trying to justify a hobby may be an ethical dead end, maybe a moral dead end. It's, it's, you know, nobody tries to get people who ride quad bikes to justify their hobby, right? They do it because it's fun. That's why you ride a quad bike. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when people are tearing up uh, uh, land when they're doing quad bikes, what do they do? They either make the land you're not allowed to ride there, or they make trails. Okay, problem solved, done. And we never talk about the use of money or the use of gas or the use of personal resource for it because it's a hobby. You, you do it for fun. Um, when you try to make that into some kind of philosophical position, it gets a little bit awkward. And I think we hit that as well. And I think we, we hit that because... <clears throat> Like I've said before, that we are, we feel very connected to research and science in our hobby, in, in the in the aquarium hobby, um, closer than anybody on a quad bike is ever going to get to the people who design quad bikes, mostly because uh, we're all a bunch of people who like to see what we can do in, with things in glass boxes. Mm -hmm. But trying to justify that, you know, the, the the biggest justification that comes up is my hobby. It's educational. And I think that's a little bit of an empty justification. Certainly, it's educational for, for the hobbyist. Absolutely. That's part of the fun of any hobby is learning stuff. But to try to bring that to the broader stage of saying it's educational in general, um, I, I, think, I think the math even doesn't work out on that. You know, um, What do you normally hear people say something like, uh, uh, you know, well, a lot of people come into my house and they see my tank and they love the ocean because of it. It's like, oh... Really? <laughs> really? You know, uh, first of all, how many people do you have coming through your house? Um, and second of all, how many of them do anything except go home and if they remember your tank, say, wow, you had, that guy had a really nice tank. You know, you could talk a little bit about, you know, no, those aren't plants. Those are animals. But uh, I, I don't really think, I think using that as kind of a, a weak foundation as a justification. Um, Considering that if you get 100 people through your house to look at your aquarium, that's a lot of people coming through your house versus like my work has 1.5 million people a year come through there. So it's not – just from resource allocation, 
home aquaria as educational devices are woefully inefficient, I think, to be using it as a justification. Hashtag Steinhardt Aquarium. <laughs> Boom. Hashtag Karen Talbot Art. <laughs> Um, so short answer, we're really not sure that it is justifiable. Short answer? Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, yes, it. I agree. Well, I always agree with Rich because I know it's a smart <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> with Rich, it's going to be very unpleasant. Um, but, but having said that, um, you know, in my work as a science writer, I certainly have encountered many marine biologists who will say to me that they got their start because they had an aquarium growing up or that was the inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, again, I think that's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of overall aquarists. So I don't think it's a justification for the hobby, but I think that's something we should probably at least put out there and acknowledge. Sure. Sure. And I don't want to say that the, 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 I only get involved well, no, that's not true. I was going to say I only get involved in this conversation when, but uh, that's not true. I, the, it's it's daylight. I want to be involved in this conversation, but I, I don't think it's it's that uh, um, there aren't individual things and people that benefit from the hobby. I think there's definitely a percentage, but trying to say that the hobby, at least as it is now, uh, should continue because it's educational seems a little awkward to me, because because. You know, before 1960, when fish keeping was a tiny, tiny thing, you know, you know, oh, well, here we go. Jacques, did Jacques Cousteau have aquariums? You know, it's, it's, there are other avenues in. But, but at the same time, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, Rich is the big downer guy here. Um, but you are. I, yeah, I am. But uh, I've got absolutely no problem with saying the hobby, the justification for the hobby is because I enjoy it. I think that's, that's really the justification. I think that the question then comes into or becomes, um, is the hobby okay to partake in? You know, I, I don't partake in puppy mills, the hobby of puppy mills, because right. I think that's a bad hobby. Um, so, I don't think our hobby is bad. I think it could be better. So may I add, may I add another angle to this in terms of ethics and morality? Yes, please. So, so I think, I think, I think, um, so I'm going back to the, what did you call them? The quad? Quad bikes? Quad bikes. Those are the, those are ATVs. Yeah. Wheelers. Yeah. They call them different things everywhere. So, so when Karen and I used to, um, when we used to live in California, uh, the great state of California, the golden state, um, we used to, uh, we used to go up to, um, to a place north of Los Angeles on the Piru River, and we used to fish there a lot, uh, fly fish there a lot. And right adjacent to where you would go in, there was this huge area that was dominated by ATVs, quad, quad, I keep wanting to call them quad, quad cops, bikes. quad bikes, quad machines, bikes, <laughs> motor bikes, whatever. Yeah, so, and, and I know that there was a, that there was a, and I did a little bit of research at the time because I was working on an article, and I know that there was a, um, there was a conflict between the land and land use and those people who wanted to use the land in different ways. And so a big talking point that came into that discussion was the right, because it was public land, the right to do whatever you wanted, to recreate whatever way made you happy or fulfilled you or whatever. And, and I've been hearing that conversation a lot with aquarium keeping recently, that it's a right, there's a right to keep an aquarium. Um, you know, that, that these are, this is a public resource and to keep them in your home, or especially if we're talking about aquaculture animals to keep aquaculture animals, it's a right. So how does that, how does that play into this rich in terms of, in terms of the overall ethics of it, is there a right to keep these animals in your home? Well, I think there's a difference between saying there's a right to keep the animals in my home and there's a right to have an aquarium in my home. Um, and again, here we go with the sexy philosophy stuff. Absolutely a right to keep an aquarium in your home. What you stock it with, however, is where I would think the rights change or well, become not available. So is it... Uh, because I could say 
It should be a right for me to have a ferret in my house or piranha. I can't have either legally in the state of California. So the, the, the question of rights is a weird thing. We're not using public lands in our aquarium. We're taking animals from some other lands and using them. You know, my, so has Florida and Hawaii become the interesting conversation because it's the same as public lands? Maybe, but the public lands and the use of public lands, um, that's up for debate, discussion, and rulemaking, laws. So uh, that's how you – yeah. It's a resource, so you yeah. – you know, whether you extract from it or not. So I think maybe for me what it comes down to is it comes down to duties. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I may feel like I have a right – but I also may feel like I have a more pressing duty to to a resource or to a um, to a, a belief structure or to whatever it might be um, that might uh, limit my so-called right to have that animal in my home. I would agree. I mean, you know, I have I you I have the right to go chop down trees until chopping down the trees becomes problematic for. The forest. So now we're back to responsible and sustainable and all of that. I think, uh, though, before we jump into that, possibly, the idea of duty is an interesting thing. So, um, you know, how much can you expect uh, a hobbyist, an actual hobbyist? Um, and again, let's stop uh, integrating or confusing the words trade, hobby, and industry. They're different things, they're not the same thing. So, a hobbyist. You know, should a, a new hobbyist have a duty to the world? Like, I guess, I guess I would love that in a perfect world that, you know, everyone felt a duty to everything. But at that point, then you start going, well, how much electricity am I using to run my aquarium? And, and don't I have a duty not to have some plant burning coal so I can run lights to grow animals? So it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's not a, there's not a goal. There's not an end point. It's a discussion. You know, how, how can I possibly justify running a thousand watts of anything in my living room when there are people on the street starving or don't have a place to come in out of the cold? Um, so, so ethics and morals is a very bizarre, um, long kind of spectrum, which we can talk on. Right. So, so it, I think that's important for people to realize as well. When I'm demanding my right to have or fighting for my right to keep these animals, there's a bigger picture here, which I guess is what you're talking about with duty. Um, I guess since we brought up sustainability again, how, how does sustainability and ethics correlate? Is it something mm -hmm. that goes hand in hand? How, how are they relative to one another? Well, I don't think it's something – goes hand in hand categorically. I think that um, you can clearly have a sustainable fishery that is highly unethical if you want to define sustainability by the way that fisheries managers define sustainability. You can take, in terms of maximum yield, you can take a number of species from a fishery that will not impact a population of that species over time and future generations taking that same number, yet you could still do horrific, unspeakable things to every one of those animals, mm -hmm. which would be arguably unethical. And wasteful as well. But still sustainable. Correct. But I think you have to... I think, oh. I, I think we have to make that not um, a thought experiment. So what does that actually... You could have a population of fish that you catch all the fish out of and you um, throw them in a pile to, to just die in the sun and they don't get used by anything for any purpose at all. That seems like an unethical, sustainable hobby. <laughs> yeah, and so I think what we talked about, one of the things we talked about last time, Caitlin, and you put up that nifty graphic, mm -hmm. um, when you combine, when you look at true sustainability, you look at the intersection of economics, sociology, so socioeconomic, and then environmental. And you find that sustainability is really only that thing that's in the very center of those three. So obviously having a, a, 
a, a much broader discussion, ethical discussion about sustainability involves a heck of a lot more than maximum yield or sustainable maximum yield, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what we talk about in fishery science. Um, and I don't know how that, you know, I mean, so if you talk to Robert Wittner, AKA Snorkel Bob, um, he would tell you that, I think he would tell you what he's told me when I've interviewed him in the past, he would tell you that it's unethical to keep an animal in a glass box. It's unethical mm -hmm. to take an animal off a reef in Hawaii and put it in a glass box, whether that glass box be 20, 30, 90, 300, whatever, um, gallons. Um, so if we look at it that way, um, I don't know. I mean, is that, is, is that, you can take those fish off the reef in a sustainable fashion, but he would tell you from a, from a sociological standpoint, that's not sustainable. Right. Sociological in, in respect to the animal's welfare? I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what he would probably, he wants to focus on the, the ethics of keeping those animals. Boy, I sure hope that guy's a vegan. Right. And that was what my first, and I don't know where he is today on this. So please, if you're watching Robert Whitner, get in touch with Caitlin and, uh, and tell her you want to come on and we'll all talk about this together. But the last time I interviewed him on this topic and I asked him that question, he ate fish and, um, and I was interviewing him in Hawaii on Maui and he, uh, we specifically talked about the example of a mahi mahi or a dolphin fish or a gerardo, depending on where you live. Um, and he said that he ate mahi-mahi, but he might consider not eating mahi-mahi if he had a personal face-to-face -face experience with a mahi-mahi. Wow, so, what, a, what an ethically bankrupt position. So, he, <laughs> hey, so his, his connection to, um, to these reef fish was was predominantly in our discussion about a personal relationship with the fish that he developed diving and snorkeling on the reefs. But what about like endemic fish in other parts of the world that he hasn't encountered? Are those collectible? Does that escape his rationale? My sense was that all reef fish being charismatic and beloved by divers fell into the category of fishes. And if you read his books and you read his sort of wider ranging literature, um, it applies to fishes outside of Hawaii. But reef well, fish is predominantly. That's just another, it's, it's a version of the, the, the save, save the pretty animals argument, right? So, which is, which is people care about the animals they think are pretty, uh, which, is, which is not a good position. But it's an emotional position. You know, why do we not eat dogs and cats in the United States? Because they're so cute. <laughs> they're so cute, even though we kill something like 10 million of them a year uh, and throw them away. So uh, that's an interesting uh, ethical position there as well. But uh, it, and, and ethics, ethics and morals are, are interesting because they're, they're, they're not absolute. They're up for discussion, which, which – always makes it difficult uh, because if we got new information that, well, clearly, clearly taking a, um, a large tang and putting it in a one gallon bucket and trying to keep it alive that way seems unethical. So there's, there's some point where you're giving the animal a reasonable amount of space and reasonable care that it feels like it's ethical to keep it. There's got to be some way in there. It feels like to me, and just to complicate it even more, I think because we eat fish, it becomes even more confusing with fish because it's okay in the one instance to kill the fish, but over here it's not okay to keep the fish and try to keep it alive and healthy. Um, and I think it was a, a skeptical reefing, reef keeping six that we delved into that. Did that spark anything for you, Rhett? Yeah. What I just said? Yeah, and I think like let, let's explore the food the food argument even further. Um, we talk a lot, and in fact, it's been leveraged for marketing use um, increasingly in the past decade. Um, we find that uh, people are more inclined to want to buy an animal that has been treated in a certain fashion and killed in a certain fashion 
more so than an animal that was killed in a fashion that we abhor. So free range chickens Mm -hmm. or, you know, grass fed beef or whatever it might be. So I think, you know, I, I think the consumer thinks a lot more about these things today than they did probably 10 years ago. Absolutely true. At the same time, factory farm chicken still outsells free yep. range chicken. So it's less expensive. It's less expensive. Most people don't want to think about it. Nobody wants to know how sausage is made. You really don't want to know how you get your meat. Yeah. It, it's not something you want to know because if you don't know, you can hide and pretend like all is good. Once you find out, it's a little bit different. And, and, and I guess that gets a little bit back to what we were talking about last time is, is, is the data. <laughs> so how, 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 how bad, how bad, how bad, you like that? Um, we know there are, just from the scale of, our, of the industry that supplies the hobby, we know there's got to be some things that aren't being done as well as we want them to sometimes. But we don't know how much that is. You know, I don't know, you know, there's that, that picture of all the dead yellow tangs that went around for a while and that were found in the trash can um, in, Ho- in Hawaii, which could have been from a million things. You know, it could have been five years worth of morts. It could have been lots of things, but that, that picture plays. Um, but is that an isolated incident? Uh, you know, is that, is that less than 1% of what happens? Seems like it might be. Um, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be even better, but, uh, um, and I lost my track of thought there. I went off well, on a rail <laughs> as a trade. I don't think, or as a hobby, an industry, industry trade hobby. Um, I, <laughs> I don't think we, um, I don't think we need to be a hundred percent cage free chickens or cage free eggs. Um, and this is something I've talked about a lot over the past, gosh, five or six years now. Um, I think that consumers in other arenas have showed us that you can have cage-free eggs, cage-free hen eggs on the shelf for a price premium, and you can have regular eggs, whatever that means, on the shelf, cheap, and people will buy both. The market seems to support both. And the industry has figured out how to balance and the, the individual stores have figured out how to balance how much of each you need to have in stock. And that seems to be a good thing. Um, that's something that the aquarium trade on the retail level has been very resistant to embracing. I have had Aquarius. So we talked a little bit last time about quality Marine and short supply chains. Mm-hmm. Um, so quality Marine is willing to, give their retail customers a QR code tag for every fish that they purchase. And that QR code tag would go on the tank in the retail store and the customer, the end user could walk in, the aquarist could walk in, scan the QR code tag and find out exactly where that fish was harvested, when it was harvested, blah, 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 blah. Many retailers have resisted putting those QR code tags on their tank and why are they resistant? What they've told me in interviews is they're resistant. And these are even retailers who are, who I really respect and are high-end retailers. They've told me they're resistant to doing that because they feel like it devalues the fish in the tank next to it. So why do we take this approach to retail in the aquarium trade, but we're fine with it in the egg trade or the coffee trade or the wine trade? or all these other places where we have fair trade, organic, free range, sustainable products on the shelf next to. I can tell you why. I can tell you why. I can tell you, but I'll have to wait till the next time. (laughs) Uh, I think the difference is, is that our hobby is a luxury and eggs are food. Mm -hmm. And when you start messing with people's food, I mean, we, we know factory farming is bad. I mean, we know how bad this is for the animals, ethically. We, we, we know it. Yet, and we've known it for decades. It doesn't stop. There's something about food that makes people want to look the other way. Um, 
but there's something about a luxury that makes people want to nail it to the wall. <laughs> but I would argue that, that most seafood out there is a luxury. Most people who are going to the fishmongers and buying an expensive piece of fish are doing it. it these, aren't, these aren't people who are... You know, oh, but you, you just changed the goalposts from eggs to, to fish. Fair. Yes. So I think that's a, I think that's an important distinction. Yes. Yeah. But a lot of my work deals with fisheries and with seafood. fisheries. And so I would I would agree that the uh, you know eating swordfish is a ridiculous luxury, and we've seen a backlash against that. And I think rightfully so. Are you, well, are you uh, we, fish fishery? No, we we because no, I'll I'm, you on the sword. <laughs> It's back, That's right? We, had, well, we even had that swordfish fishery, my friend. <laughs> Look, all I know is they canceled that swordfish show, which must mean we've won that battle. But they uh, did cancel Wicked Tuna. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a weird thing, right? I mean, that's the whole point that it's weird, that the people and their ethics, where they put them is very strange. I'll, I want to add one thing to the thing about the QR codes and why people you – know, there was a fish store here – called green marine that their whole thing was green and and you try to see this every once in a while so it was all captive bred fish it was all captive frags um and they couldn't keep a business uh because people when it comes down to it and i think we get to this this is the new thing i've been thinking lately is that uh people in a hobby are in it for fun and they don't want to have to research the ethics of every single thing they do. And I think um, as opposed to food where there's space, where the market is so big and there's enough people who are going to pay an extra buck um, for their eggs or five bucks for their free range chicken because it assuages some of their guilt for eating food, uh, e eating live animals, which is a wonder, which is a fine thing. I think, I think the, the aquarium hobby isn't that big and it's uh and it's so there isn't enough people who are willing to spend the extra money to make it worth the while of the retailer to feel like that they should have a section devoted to that um perhaps that's that's part of that reason there um and, and so that's why i keep thinking that it, if it, if there's going to be a difference it's got to come from the vendor side it's got to come from the import side. You, you have to fix the problem if there is a problem before it gets to the consumer because the consumer, you know, if I'm flying a quadcopter, I'm trying to mess with your head now, Rhett, by using another quad word. If I'm buying a quadcopter for 60 bucks, I'm not checking the, 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 you know, the legality of where I'm allowed to fly it. I bought a toy for fun that I'm going to fly around my house. If I'm going to buy a Nemo fish for my kid, you know, is it really up to me to research and, and have an ethical discussion before I do that? Well, yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. And the answer is yes, but <laughs> most people aren't going to do that. I would suppose, because you could argue the same thing, before I buy a $60 quadcopter toy, shouldn't I be, where is that made? You know, is that made by uh, slave children in uh, Maine? who work at a sweatshop in Maine, in Maine, where Red Talbot lives? Well, I, I guess, you know, the, the difference, though, I think, is that... So, so let's come back to one of my favorite topics, the media. Um, and I think that this comes back to how informed people who buy aquarium fish may be. Um, sure, sure. When, when it comes down to... I mean, I think you'd be hard-pressed to not have read in the mainstream media about um, sweatshops or about, um, you know, unsustainable fisheries or, you know, any number of other things. But I don't think that's necessarily the case for most people who are in the aquarium hobby. I don't think that they, I don't think we should expect that they've had exposure to the full breadth of the aquarium hobby and Absolutely. how the global trade works, um, their kid might see Finding Nemo and they might go to Petco and buy a clownfish. And that's kind of where it ends for them. Right. And that's, and that's probably the majority of quote-unquote hobbyists. And that's probably the majority of 
the economic driver behind this trade hobby industry. <laughs> I, I, that seems to be the case. Um, and I can't see a reason not to argue that. I, you know, I, I've argued elsewhere that perhaps there should be a, um, uh, a, a rule, however you want to make that, whether that's legal or uh, industrial, uh, that new hobbyists should only should start out with captive raised animals, captive bred animals. Not ca let's you know, you know. There's no reason for a new hobbyist to be buying anything from the wild to experiment on. Mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah, there's no justification for that. Um, you're going to make mistakes like you are in any hobby. Um, here's a animal that's been made specifically for this. It doesn't impact anybody. It doesn't take away from anything. Uh, it's an entry level thing. Go to town, you know, just like you would with any food animal or any animal you're feeding to another animal, at least in the States. So, you know, that's okay. But when you start going, you know, you're not going to want a new hobbyist to buy an obligate carnivore uh, to keep in their first aquarium. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. But the only way that's going to happen is if the industry, I don't think the hobby, if the industry says this is how it should be, this is how we make it more sustainable and more responsible and more ethical. And I think, I, an, and I think an important point to then follow up and probably not in this conversation, but in future conversations, an important point to follow up on is where does that fall? Where does the responsibility fall? Does it fall on the importer or does it fall on the exporter? Because, you know, who drives the industry? Is yes, it that's, that go ahead, that's the question. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's something that we really need to explore is, you know, is it the imp so I spend I spend a lot of time in source countries and Rich has spent a lot of time in source countries. I spend a lot of time in source countries reporting on exporters. And so I spend a lot of time in exporter facilities getting to sort of see the day to day. And what I hear from exporters in source countries like Indonesia, Philippines, wherever, I hear from these exporters that they feel a tremendous amount of pressure from importers to fulfill certain shipments. In other words, this importer in Los Angeles will accept this very large shipment if we can include X number of this specific species. Sure. And if we can't provide that, then they're going to cancel their order at the last minute, and we're going to be stuck with all these animals in our facility in the source country that we then need to scramble and find someplace else to sell them, and we're probably going to end up offloading them for a really cheap price and... I think that's part of a very broken dynamic that we need to address. Right. And sure. And at the same time, you hear importers saying, uh, I didn't order these. They just filled my boxes with this stuff. I didn't ask for it. What am I supposed to do with it now? Yeah. And then you hear all that up and down the supply chain. So there's a lot of hot potato. And again, without data, we really don't know what to believe. It's, it's, some of everything is true, and that's a, that's a hard place to be trying to make decisions from. One of the, the common points that I keep hearing come up, and you know, like I said, we're, we're not going to get to it this time, but I think we really need to explore what data there is because it just it keeps coming up, and like you said, it's, it's not exactly out there, but for sure. Hopefully, uh, in the near future, we can get to that. Is there anything else that the sexy podcast can cover for you, Caitlin? <laughs> I think uh, we covered um, a good amount. Uh, I think there's a lot more to explore, and I think there's a lot more sexy stuff to discuss. <laughs> and <laughs> hopefully, we uh, we can spark more conversations between people and, you know, keep it going. Uh, yeah. I'd like to talk about hobby media at some point. Oh yeah. Me too. It's a mess. It's so bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> Present company excluded. He said, regretfully. Oh, uh,
So we're here again with. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Oh, God. God bless. Uh, Hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. YOLO. <laughs> <laughs>